Welcome to today's virtual seminar, The Best Practices for Soil Moisture Filled Measurements, presented by Lauren Bissey, Decagon Soil Moisture Product Manager. Thanks, Rhea. My name is Lauren Bissey, and I'll be giving the talk today on best practices of soil moisture measurements. I've been working with soil moisture data for about six years now, and I've made a lot of mistakes during that time. My goal today is to give you all of the experience from those six years in about an hour so that you won't make the same mistakes that I did. The talk assumes that you already have some soil moisture sensors. It doesn't necessarily have to be Decagon sensors, but those are the ones that I have the most experience with, and those are the ones that you'll see during the talk. The data sets are from Decagon sensors. That being said, any dielectric sensor, the same ideas will apply for those sensors. I'm guessing you're watching this because you want good soil moisture data. And this is an example of what I thought was a really good soil moisture data set. The reason I thought that was because we were able to use this data set to make some decisions and learn some things about the soil moisture profile in, this, in the application we were using this in. But what specifically makes a data set usable? we need to know a little bit about the site in order to understand what the data mean. The sensors need to be installed in a location that addresses the goals of either a study or a, a research need, or even if it's just to schedule irrigation, they need to be in a location that allows you to do that. The installation itself has to be really good. Uh, data collection has to be done in a way that allows you to access the data when you need it and allows you to collect the data temporally in the field at the times that you need it. You need to be able to share the data that you collect with someone else so that they also understand it. So how do we make sure that we're going to get usable data? We have a lot of different things here and none of these are require any special skills to do. These are all something that you could learn today and probably go out tomorrow and do if that's the time that you need to do the installation. So we're going to talk a little bit about pre-installation sensor testing. That's something that you could do easily in an hour. We're going to talk about selecting a site. That's going to take a little more time, but I'm going to try to give you the tools to make that a little easier. Collecting necessary site data should not be a problem for anybody. Uh, we're going to talk about a few installation techniques to make sure that the data you get are good. We'll go through proper maintenance to protect the setup during the season. We'll talk a little bit about data interpretation and additionally sharing that data and the data interpretation. So this is just a thought question here. I want you to think about this and then we're going to talk about the answer. I just showed you that list of all the things we have to do to make sure that the data set is good, but what is the most important? Is it a good installation? Is it knowing the necessary site data? Is it maintaining the site? Or is it the type of calibration used on the sensors? All of these things are clearly important, but which is the most important? We've, we've done this test before and we've gotten all sorts of different answers, but I'll tell you this. In my experience, about 80% of getting good usable data is in a good installation. So if you listen to nothing else and do nothing else during the seminar, listen to that part. And if you're out in the field and you don't protect your cables, at least to make sure that you have a good installation. If you do that, you're 80% there. That being said, these other things are not very difficult to do, and so that little bit of extra effort is going to get you to the 100%. So I want to tell you a little story about uh, a seminar we had here, and we were, we were doing a journal club with a paper that was the Clark Top paper from 1980. Clark Top was the grandfather, he still is the grandfather of soil moisture measurements, and we were reading his paper on the calibration of soil moisture dielectric sensors. And 
we got into a big discussion about how to interpret data and the best accuracy. And our senior research scientist piped up and said, you know, the best way to learn about the sensors is to just go and play with them in the lab for an hour and get familiar with what they do. And that's really the truth. Take an hour with your sensors and stick them in some saturated soil in the lab. See what they read in air. See what they read in different soil types. This is going to give you very quickly a solid understanding about what soil moisture data look like in different scenarios. Also before you go out in the field, learn about the loggers that you're using to collect the data. Some of the loggers, like the Decagon loggers, they don't have a huge suite of functionality, but they are really quick and easy to set up. You just plug the sensors in and set a measurement interval. There's other loggers out there that have capabilities beyond what you would ever need, like the Campbell, Civ Campbell Scientific Data Loggers. Those are wonderful and they can do monitoring and event-based sampling and control, but those loggers require programming. So do not leave that program writing until the night before, especially if you've never programmed these loggers. Learn about the programming language at least two weeks in advance to write these programs. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about site selection. And I could do a whole talk on this and we're just going to touch on it. The goal of this is just to get you started on picking the right site. But with your experimental design, you're going to have to take that a little bit farther. When you're getting started, clearly define what your goals are for gathering soil moisture data. I've had people say, well, I'm doing a plant study, so I need soil moisture data. And I've said, well, well what are you, what are you going to do with it? What, you, need, you need to know what you're going to do with the data so that you, the data can work for you and address your goals. The biggest issue with defining this and de determining the right site is the spatial variability in soil moisture. You've got treatment to treatment variability, which is great. It uh, definitely allows us to look at treatment differences. But there are other things that can confound those, those variations, like uh, landforms. Definitely the soil moisture at the top of a hill is going to be different than the valley right beside it. You're going to have soil moisture variability at depth. If you put a sensor on one soil type and put a sensor at the different, a different soil type, you're going to definitely see some different variability. You're going to see differences with soil density. If you put the sensor near roots versus 10 centimeters away from roots, you're not going to see the same values. Think about when you're placing your sensors. Do you want these under a canopy or do you want these in open spaces? And if you're comparing things, you want to be consistent with those things. And that, all of those things are in addition to the random variability that we see. The last thing you want to think about when you're selecting a site is not necessarily a scientific factor, but it is a practical factor. You have to remember you're going to have to collect these data at some point. The wireless data loggers have made that a lot easier, and so that might not be an issue. The, the cellular data loggers make that very easy, but you need to get to the data when you want to download. And often, even just moving a couple of feet away is not going to compromise the scientific merit of the study, but it's going to allow you to collect the data, either wire wirelessly or a little easier than you could before. So this is one of the things I try to think about when I'm designing a study. You really want to define the goal of the study and then list the sources of variability that you're going to see. If you understand those sources really well, which is pretty uncommon, then you can monitor less. But if you don't, you're going to have to monitor, monitor some of those sources of variability that are going to affect the study. There's no way that you can monitor every source of variability. It's just not possible. It's not possible in any budget and it's, it's not possible with any amount of time. So you're going to have to pick the ones that are most important and monitor those. 
So this is the time that you spend a little bit of time just thinking about the study, what sources could m affect your goal in a major way, and which ones are minor, and go from there. The more you monitor, the better, but you can't monitor everything. One thing you definitely need to remember is soil moisture variability with depth. And there are going to be really interesting moisture dynamics in a soil profile, but generally soil type and density will change with depth. And root depth will have a major influence on your soil moisture profile. So if a, if a sensor reading at a deeper location doesn't seem right, don't necessarily assume the sensor is broken. That might be telling you something really interesting about your soil moisture profile. It's just worth remembering that lots of things can change over depth, and not just soil moisture. Chris, Cha this is a picture of Chris Chambers, and we hired Chris specifically to help you out with planning your sites and also interpreting your data and helping you with anything else. If you have more questions about this or want someone to just look over some of your ideas, we, we can't do your experimental design, unfortunately. That kind of puts us in a tight spot, but we can look over it and give you our opinions. And Chris is a phenomenal resource for that. So feel free to call us or email us anytime. I put together a site characterization worksheet so that you wouldn't have to worry too much about which data you might need when you're doing uh, the installation. So just print this site characterization worksheet out and take it out in the field with you. It includes things like soil type, soil density, different types of cover, information about the irrigation system, notes on why the site was picked, different events that might affect your uh, data gathering, like a harvest, and which sensors are at what depth. So I'm not going to go over this because it's already on a sheet of paper that you can take in the field at any time. It's stuff that you're going to think about when you're there, but you're definitely going, not definitely. I would definitely forget by the time I was ready to analyze the data. Okay, now we're at the most important part. So if you haven't listened, listen now. Like I said, installation is 80% of getting a good soil moisture data set. And just to give you an idea of some uh, accuracy numbers, uh, variations in density could probably give you an uh, accuracy of, or an accuracy loss of two to three percent. A bad installation could give you uh, accuracy loss of greater than 10 percent possibly. So these are the reasons that you really have to be careful with this. It doesn't take a lot more time to do a good installation, which is the really good news. There are a lot of ways that you can install these sensors. It doesn't matter if they're vertical or horizontal. What does matter is that they're installed in undisturbed soil with no air gaps around the sensor. So if you're digging a trench, push those sensors in straight and don't move them around a little. If you're pushing these into the bottom of an augered hole, make sure you push into the undisturbed soil at the bottom of the hole. With every sensor before you fill back the trench or the augered hole, Test the sensor with a ProCheck. That's our handheld instantaneous reading device. And make sure that the reading is good. Because it's going to be painful to try to dig that sensor up later if the data are bad. And you might have collected a season's worth of bad data by that point. So just check while you're out there. ProCheck is a not very expensive device. And it's going to save you a lot of time and a lot of worry. If you know those sensors are reading good when you leave your installation, then you won't have to worry for a while. I was reluctant to include this, side, this slide, but I did it just in case after I was in the field with a handful of people that didn't remember what sensors were installed at what depths. So just make sure to label your sensors. You might write this stuff down and take it back with you and put it in the lab somewhere. But if someone else is out in the field or you forget that manual, this is a good secondary reminder of what sensor is installed at what depth. So write down the type of sensor 
and at what depth the sensor is in, and any other information that you feel might be useful. If you're installing hundreds of sensors, you could even get an electronic labeling device to barcode the sensors, but I just get just masking tape and a marker, and that's plenty. Okay, now we're moving on to maintenance and data collection. This slide shows two different sites, two different ways that people decided to maintain their data logging systems. And you can imagine which one I think is better. One looks better, and I'll tell you this, we visited this site on the left because sensors were failing, and it turned out a shovel or a rodent had cut a lot of those cables. So just make sure that you protect your cables uh, with either PVC pipe or some other type of pipe material anytime they're exposed above the surface and you won't have to worry about rodents. We do impregnate the soil moisture sensors cables with a rodent repellent, but it doesn't always work. And to tell you the truth, I think honestly they like it sometimes. So just be safe and protect the cables with a a couple of dollars of PVC. Even with the best cable protection, things might happen in the field and you want to make sure you have a plan for checking up your, on your data every so often. There's uh, the newer cellular capabilities make that a lot easier where you could check every day and make sure the data are collecting normally, that the batteries are still full and everything is working fine. If you can't do that, just make sure you get out into the field every so often, if possible, and make sure everything's working. And just remember that if you go out and check, in all likelihood nothing will happen because just because you're going out there and checking. If it's at a location that you can't get to very often, I would strongly consider some sort of option to allow you to check on the data wirelessly. So we just did maintenance and data collection. Now let's move on to data interpretation and sharing data. So this is the data set that I showed you initially on one of the first slides, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. It was a sensor, these were two sensors installed at a vineyard. The, the data I have circled there uh, the higher sensor was at 30 centimeters and the lower trace there is at 60 centimeters and at the at the oval there the viticulturalist was trying to deficit irrigate and as you can see at that case he had his water content really really high at the 30 centimeter his goal was actually to get water down to the 60 centimeter so he irrigated a lot longer than he normally did but you can see we never got down to 60 centimeters. He irrigated for 30 hours and never got down to 60 centimeters in his soil. And the reason I gave at a talk that I gave in Spain was, well, the ET was higher than the infiltration and that's why we never got down to 60 centimeters. And I got a lot of push back in the room, no that's not why, it's because the sensor's broken and other people in the room said sometimes in Spanish, which I don't speak, no it's because of a hard pan in the soil and some people said no she's right, the ET was really high, it's July. And my point with this is that the data set doesn't necessarily tell you what's going on. There are a lot of possibilities for one data set and you're really going to have to think through and sometimes go out into the field again to really figure out what's going on. Like I said, there could be many interpretations for the da same data set. If you have the capabilities to go out during the field and see what's going on, do that and make notes on your data set of what happened. Maybe there was a big storm. Write that on your data set that you c so that you can tell yourself, oh, when there's a lot of water, this is what happens to the soil moisture. Make sure you're revisiting your goal and making sure that those uh, data are helping you accomplish your goals. And we're going to go through a couple of different ways that we can view data that will help us possibly understand what's going on when a first look doesn't 
necessarily tell us what's happening. So this is the way that we traditionally look at data. We look at a temporal time set of different traces of sensors at different depths. This is a site we have at Cook Farm, which is a Washington State University research farm. The sensors are at every foot, essentially, from 30 to 150 centimeters. And the interesting thing about this site was that the 150 centimeter sensor is below the 120. That, that was not right. Something was going on there. So when they went out there and dug, they found a hard pan between 120 and 150, which was causing a little bit of a perched water table there. That's just an example of times that you might have to go out in the field and dig down and see what's going on. Regardless, we're still going to use this data set to uh, explore some other ways of looking at data. So, same data set, we're going to take three different slices. So three discrete days, June 1st, July 1st, and August 1st, let's see, yep. And we're going to look at monthly variability over, over depth. We'll take those three days, and we plotted them here. Oh, I've got the extra one there in May. So when you plot volumetric water content versus depth, you get an entirely different view of things. And you can even um, integrate under the curve to see how much water was lost and at which depth that that water was coming from. So this is one way of looking at the same data set. Other people are more comfortable working with water potential measurements. A lot of studies require this as part of fulfilling the goal. And so sometimes you might need to convert your water content data to water potential data. That's not uh, a difficult thing to do. The first thing you're gonna have to do is have a moisture release curve for your specific soil. Moisture release curves are a characteristic of every different soil type and they're going to vary. You couldn't use just one for any soil. We created this moisture release curve with an instrument called a high prop in the high range there and a WP4C in the drier range. And this curve was used, we've got water content on the y-axis and water potential on the x-axis. So we could convert all of our water content values to water potential after we created this moisture release curve. When we did that, this is what the data looked like. So not very different from before, but now we've got our data in water potential units instead of water content units, which allows us to tell where we are in terms of permanent wilting point and field capacity. In plant studies, that's a very interesting way of looking at the data. So we just talked about a variety of different ways that you could present the data or interpret the data. Sometimes you're gonna have to do that to understand what's going on. Once you are finished with that and have something that you're going to present or share, you're going to have to remember to include a little bit more information with the data so that other people can understand it and make their own conclusions. A lot of this information is needed for publications too, so if you go ahead and put it in there initially, the reviewer is not going to push it back asking for this information. Make sure you talk about what type of sensor you used. And when I say what type of sensor, I mean include not only that it's a dielectric sensor or a decagon sensor, but say the model number, regardless of the company. Some, some sensors are newer, some sensors are older, and you don't want to confuse readers with that information. Make sure to include the measurement interval so that people will know that you've captured the information in, the, in a resolution that addresses your goal. You're going to want to include soil information, especially when you're just having water content data as your data set, because 20% volumetric water content in a sand is going to be very different than 20% water content in a more clay soil from the plant's perspective. So you need to include what type of soil your sensors are installed. 
Definitely make sure you put the, de the depth that the sensors are installed. And as we're moving forward with massive data sharing and meta metadata and sharing across massive landscapes, you're, you might need to include raw data and the type of calibration you use to get your water content. I wouldn't worry about this so much for publications, but if you're working with metadata, knowing that information and being able to give that to someone else is going to make everybody's job a lot easier. So to conclude, if you do a good installation, you're about 80% there. So if you do nothing else, do that. But remember, everything else is not that difficult, and it's going to help you get to 100%. Make sure you play with your instrumentation before you take it out into the field. It'll help you later interpret the data. Make sure you document anything about your field site that may, will help you understand the data. Protect your loggers and cables. A great installation isn't going to be worth anything if, if the cable gets cut a day after you install the sensors. Have a plan for what you're going to do during the season to collect data and maintain the site. And don't get discouraged if you don't necessarily understand the data the first time you look at it. It's not necessarily easy to understand any soil moisture data. It's a difficult variable to understand. And ask help. Ask for help from colleagues or from people here at Decagon or other experts that could help you understand the data. And the end result of all of this is going to be that you're going to have data that you can use to either publish or make a decision. Oops, we skipped a slide here. Okay, so if you have any questions, just contact me. My email is lauren at decagon.com. You can re reach Chris Chambers or the rest of our support, support department here, support at decagon.com. We also have a lot of questions posted on our forums from other users, and, and our scientists here go through and answer those questions. And it's sometimes really interesting to read what sort of issues people run into, so I encourage you to visit our forums and post a question or just read what other people are writing. Thanks for attending today, and please contact us if you have any questions. Good luck collecting soil moisture data, and good luck understanding it.